Hey students, how are you? This is uh, Professor Armando Villarreal and today we begin uh, Unit 2 uh, and we're going to start with Unit 2 Section 1 and uh, in the book we're going to start reading uh, where the Enlightenment or the Great Awakening is, okay? Uh, and seven Years War right around that period we're going to talk about the Enlightenment first because the Enlightenment is, of course, very important. Uh, again, this is for History 1301, uh, and we are in the second unit. And we're going to talk about uh, reason uh, and religion um, in the 18th century. Now, the 18th century is a truly revolutionary, in the, by the way, of inventions, okay? American colonists at the time uh, were deeply influenced by uh, the European philosophers, okay? Uh, a lot of these individuals now with uh, Gutenberg, uh, Gutenberg Bible uh, and, you know, reading material being uh, uh, distributed more, uh, with those things coming into play and the King James Bible also as well that was written in what we know now as Old English which is really just uh, was back then English okay uh, what we're gonna have with the distribution of this reading material people begin to think for themselves they begin to uh, interpret these scriptures and all of that they're reading on their own and you begin to see people move away from religion or what we see organized religion and they start to be drawn more to deism they begin to believe in the fact that there is a god there is a creator out there but that he assigns a lot less uh to what people think in other words people don't you know if you're the people believe that if you weren't good then god was going to strike you down or that God would send hurricanes and famines and pestilences because people weren't good. When in reality, God sent these. God didn't send these things. It was science. You know, like the, for example, the bubonic plague uh, under the Black Death. That was done because of the lack of cleanliness. Okay, hurricanes are done are happen because of hot air and cold air crashing with each other. Okay, so. They did not look to science at the time. It kind of sounds like now, right? 2020. Uh, now, what you begin to see is you begin to see people like Newton. You see, begin to see people like Adam Smith and John Locke that start coming up with these new theories. Of course, Newton discovers gravity and uh, indicated that humans could discover through uh, uh, just that that humans could discover rationally because the universe operated through a way in a way of natural laws natural and physical laws and and that's true there there you know i mean uh, i do a lot of competitive shooting and be, you know being able to hold a rifle steady is about 25 percent of what actually goes into getting a bullet to hit the target where you want it to the rest of it you know 25 percent of it is me holding the rifle correctly and the other 75 percent has to do with physics be it the wind be it the angle of the the sun uh the weight of the bullet the the way that the bullet is spinning the way that it comes out of the barrel i mean you name it there's a lot of factors involved in that and that's what that's what Newton begins to say. These things happen, and there is there is a rational formula for it, but it has nothing to do with God. I mean, a, a, the reason that a, a tree, a, an apple falls out of a tree, is because of gravity. That's why we don't float away. When you get into people like John Locke, they he writes an essay called Essay Concerning Human Understanding, and it's a social contract theory that God gave us the ability to gain knowledge through experimentation and understanding, right? You stick your hand, you get a piece of wire, and you stick it in a, in an electrical plug, and it, 
it's going to shock you, right? Well, then you understand that there's a current in there, and if you stick that in there, it's, it's going to shock you. It's kind of like cause and effect, right? But he says, if, if you look at these laws, if you look at these things that these mathematicians and these scientists are coming up, and you look at it rationally, you can come to, the, you can come to your own conclusion on why it works. It's, it's very simple, right? And you figure out through experimentation. That's what people start doing. Has nothing to do with God. That has nothing to do with Jesus. Has nothing to do with any of that. Okay, this is not spiritual. It's secular. It's not faith-based. All right. Then we go uh, 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 to Adam Smith, and with Adam Smith, uh, he criticizes mercantilism, and pretty much why wealthy people control so much. That's never really going to change. Now, what's going to happen here is is that locks is what really, really helps you, uh, really helps people, is that there is a social contract theory. And, and the deal is, is that we as citizens are given the power by God to choose who's going to rule us. And if that person doesn't take care of us, then we the people have the right to depose them okay if we do not have a mechanism to depose them through democracy like we do now okay now other people that are involved is people like benjamin franklin and benjamin franklin is really cool if i could ever go back in time and be somebody it would be ben franklin okay why well I mean, if he was alive right now, he would be on the cover of every magazine. I mean, he would be like, you know, I don't know, Barack Obama on steroids. You know, every week he was on a new magazine, you know, he, different album covers or, you know, that kind of stuff. He'd be on all the talk radio shows, all the TV shows and everything. He was ahead of his time. A man ahead of a time. He starts the postal service. He establishes the first library in Philadelphia. Uh, and he constantly experimented. But he was afraid because at this time, you could still get in trouble with the church. So he had to really be careful, especially because we were on the cusp of the uh, Great Awakening. So he had to be really careful. You know, he believed in regeneration of animals, you know, like when you pull the tail off and it grows back. He also believed in metamorphosis of animals, which has to do with, you know, the chrysalis of the of the butterfly and, you know, the, the frog, you know, being a tadpole and becoming a frog. A lot of these things were not believed back then. He also comes up um, with the concept of bifocals and he comes up with the franklin stove which is uh instead of having a stove in on one end of, of the room or a a, a a fireplace you get an iron stove and you put it in the middle of the room and it radiates the heat from the center outward that's the way it always happens okay um of course these were not very safe you can have a kid come up to it and put their hand on they were gonna get a nasty burn uh so in addition to that, a lot of people, you know, the way that I was taught is that when he does the experiment to uh, get a kite struck by lightning, he's actually doing that to prove to a friend that God doesn't control lightning, that you can actually coax lightning. Of course, he gets a kite made out of silk, which is a highly conducted. Then he dusts it with lead and... Uh, and then he has, a, of course, a lead wire that he uses to fly the kite with, and then he grounds it. He's the one that comes out, comes up with uh, ground and grounding your home. If, if you go walk around your home, you will see that there'll be a copper pole stuck into the house, and it'll be it'll be connected to the house and and then connected to the pole. And the the idea is that the lightning strikes the house and follows the ground, follows that copper wire, okay, uh, into the copper rod that is uh, buried in your home anywhere between 8 to 12 feet. Uh, very important, very, very important that your house be grounded, okay? Um, and instead of blowing up your house and burning your house, the lightning follows the ground and goes in the ground, right? Okay? So God doesn't control lightning. 
what controls lightning is positive and negative charge the clouds are moving in one direction the, the earth is moving in another direction and then we create a bunch of static electricity and wham you get lightning right but you know uh you know, a lot of people like to do that especially in my culture you know mexicans think that Portate bien o te va a castigar Dios, right? Now, religious institutions at this time uh, are more tolerant to allow more people to come in. There is a lot of Protestant sects, S-E-C-T-S, that come in and take over. Uh, they do tolerate each other, the Protestants, but they do not tolerate Catholics and they do not tolerate Jews, okay? Also, toleration of the church was not considered uh, a separation of church and state, which means that the church and the state, the governing body, were connected, be it the king and the queen were connected. So it was, it was a lot of times there was a lot of influence from the, from the uh, church to make the state do things. A lot of people died because of this, okay? Uh, Every time that we tend to mix religion with politics, people people die in great numbers, and it's it's not a good thing. Uh, everybody should have a faith if they want one, but religion does not belong in uh, in government. I give you an example of uh, you know countries where church and state are very strong. Places like Mexico, Iran, Iraq, you know uh, uh, the the Middle East is is very strong in, in that kind of deal but some are here and a lot of people here in the United States believe that the church and the state should be married together and but then they turn around and they scoff at the Middle East and trying to do the same thing here wealthy merchants do stay away do kind of move away from the church and when they're criticized they just give the church money and the church kind of just says okay well you know you uh, you don't come to church often, but you did, you did buy a new glass and you did do this for us. So we're going to go ahead and let it go. All right. They, they tended to be somewhat like that. Now, the Great Awakening is a really interesting movement. Okay. There's a professor, I think, uh, Professor Lindsay, um, Lindsay Light is uh, really big on the great awakening and i've actually done more than i wanted to do and i'm just fascinated by the weird things that they used to do back then because of religion and the great awakening is when you start to get away from organized church and you begin to have non-denominational christian churches that are really strong and stress the importance of fiery preaching brimstone sulfur you know the kind of stuff that would just scare the living daylights out of you and you say okay you know what forget it i'm going to go ahead and i'm going to be a religious and pious person because i don't want to burn in hell that way okay the main guy that was doing it at this time was george uh, whitefield i've actually been to philadelphia and the boston where he has preached before primarily in boston it's really cool i need to take my kids there all of you need to go to Boston. The the four cities that all of you need to go to in the in the in the East, uh, if, you know, you gotta go whether you want to or not. You have to go to New York City at least once, okay? And trust me, I would say that you're gonna end up going again. Just go absorb it, see what it's like. It's absolutely a beautiful city. You have to go to Philadelphia because it's Philadelphia, man. I mean, come on, uh, it's where it all began. You know, that's where you can see the Liberty Bell. You can see Independence Hall, the Second National Bank. I mean, there's a lot of really cool things to do in Philadelphia. You just need to go because you need to go. End of story. Because I said, okay. Now, in addition to Philadelphia is you can also go to, you have to go to Washington, D.C. Because, well, it's, it's Washington, you know. I mean, to say that you've never been to the capital would be somewhat of disappointing and i said four but really i just meant those three from uh, the eastern coast i mean there's other places that you can go to but you need to go to philadelphia and you definitely need to go and if you go to philadelphia 
you can cross the river uh, and then go see the USS New Jersey. You can go to New Jersey. Uh, you can actually make it to where you can go to New York, New Jersey, and Philadelphia. But I would just say, you know what? Just take it easy and go to Boston. Take the Independence Trail and all that. I'm sorry I used about two or three or four or five minutes. No, I didn't use that many, right? But you did. So um, I did go to the, the pulpit where George Whitefield preached. And, and also that's the same church that... Uh, George Washington used to visit when he used to go to church. You need to go to those places. Now, they called George Whitefield Sir Squintum because he had a lazy eye. So when he would preach, a lot of people thought that he was being, like, touched by the by God and his eyes. He had a crooked eye. I don't know. I, I don't know what he would do. He would just go like that or something. I don't know. But if you look in the book, look at the book or look him up on online, you can see how they make his eye crooked. It's not cool, man. If you did that today, you'd probably get fired or thrown out of class or something like that, right? Now, the the thing about these people is they concentrate on the sinfulness of humans, okay, and the mercy of God. It's very easy for me to say right here and preach, I know that somebody here, one of you, my students, committed a sin last night. Well, of course we do. I mean, we're humans. So you go to a church on a Sunday, you partied all day Saturday, and then you have George Whitefield telling you, I know that some of you did something really horrible yesterday. You know, well, of course, you partied all weekend. You know, you're over here barely awake or something like that, you know. So it's very easy to target the sinfulness of humans. Because we're weak by nature. So these guys found out. And what are you going to do at the end of the service after he gives you a sermon and you take the host and you forgive? You're going to give him some cash to feel better about what you did. You know what I mean? I always tell people, it's like if, if you give money to poor people and then you tell somebody about it, you're doing it to feel better about yourself. You know, I admire the people, these people that anonymously donate like millions of dollars and they never say who gave it. They can't write it off or anything. It's like, he donated that much? I have a friend of mine in Laredo, a cousin of mine, that always donates money anonymously. Big chunks of money. You know, and he's like, oh, I'm like, damn, that's pretty cool, man, because you, you don't get anything for it. Though his sermons are very vitriolic, a lot of criticism of individuals, and a lot of criticism of anybody that doesn't belong to their church. It's very easy to do that, right? If they're not from your religion, you're going to condemn them. And that's usually what do. I always wonder, Christians tell Muslims they're going to go to hell. Muslims tell Jews they're going to go to hell. Jews say that Mormons are going to go to hell. Mormons say that Lutherans are going to go to hell. Lutherans say that Jehovah Witnesses are going to go to hell. And Jehovah Witnesses say that uh, Catholics are going to go to hell. So it's, I guess it's, it's a big chain. Every, never mind. All right, Jonathan Edwards was another revivalist preacher, okay? If you want an example of this preacher, what I, these were a lot like T.D. Jakes and stuff like that, all right? Non-denominational, very loud, you know, they're speaking to God. Uh, now, a lot of these people are also seen as the new lights. Uh, some people think they're crazy. Other people say, no, you know what? They... Uh, they have a point, you know. A lot of the traditional clergymen do not like them. And they also attack the wealthy. They don't care. I'm telling you, they attack everybody. So controversies break out between these churches and denominations because a lot of people in a denomination would say they're right and a lot of people would say they're wrong. And what happens about this is that you get a lot of religious enthusiasm and you get new colleges. You're going to get colleges like Dartmouth, Brown, Columbia, Rutgers, Princeton, because before you had Yale and Harvard, some of the and, and William and Mary, you had some of the older colleges. Now you're going to have some of the newer colleges that are going to be a little bit more open-minded, but they're still going to be very, very conservative. Okay, nothing like we have now. I mean, uh, the TCU of today is nothing like the TCU of yesteryear. Now, let's talk about government in the mainland colonies, okay? Um, let's see if I can keep this lecture for like a little under 40 minutes, maybe 
35 or something. I didn't go off on that tangent about going to Philadelphia or whatever. <clears throat> you can see my cat over there. You see him? He's right there. Pepe the cat. <clears throat> now, government in the mainland colonies, what you begin to have here is that after uh, <clears throat> you begin to see a reorganization of the British Empire in 1696, and you have the creation of something called the Board of Trade. And they regulate trade between the United States, between the colonies, I'm sorry, and England, okay? And they tell the colonists, this is what it's going to be. It's going to be, the, our relationship is one of salutary neglect, okay? You're big, we're, we're big, you're small, you do what we tell you to, and you have no voice in assemblies or anything. We're going to send over paid governors, we're going to send over paid assemblies, the wealthy are going to tell you guys what you do, what you need to do, and what you do not need to do. And this is very important at this time, okay? Um, of course, the assemblies, because they were paid and they were wealthy, they're always broadening their powers. And a lot of people in the colonies did not like this. Remember, you got to remember Bacon's Rebellion, all right? And English authorities uh, and the the the, the what the English authorities thought and what the colonists thought were completely different. Like I said, the colonists saw it as a two-party system, okay? The two-party system where uh, the colonists uh, would ask the governors and, the, you know, they, they had an assembly that would get represented in England and they didn't like that, okay? The, the, the British saw one system, the king and parliament were supreme to everything. They could ask their colonial governors to ask things for them. That didn't mean they were going to get it, okay? So that is at the basis. That is at the very base of the American Revolution or the, 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 the you know, the, how are we going to get from one case of affairs to the other? And it's going to be, that's going to be one of them, misrepresentation or taxation without representation, okay? Um, now, at this time, the colonists are entangling, the, are, you know, uh, making alliances with the Indians because they uh, are dealing with the French on one side and dealing with the British on the other. Uh, uh, imperial rival rivalries are in disarray. I mean, England is in, in turmoil right now. Uh, and beginning, you know, you're going to have a series of wars that are going to begin more or less in 1689. And in the notes, it says 1989, and that is wrong. It's 1689. You're going to have a series of war that are going to go from 1689 to 1763. It's almost 100 years of just with very short breaks in between. You'll have a war from like... 1702 to 1713 and then you'll have another war pop up in like 1740 and then it'll end four years later and then in 1754 you'll have another war start and most of these wars are between England and France okay now the, the only one that I want you to know about is the seven years war or the French and Indian war or the great war for the empire which is uh, pretty much the the Seven Years' War. What's important about the Seven Years' War is that uh, it's drawn out over a long time. It costs the England an incredible amount of money. Uh, but the important thing about it is that the French are going to lose all of their possessions in North America uh, until they temporarily lose the Louisiana Purchase, but they lose Canada. I mean, they lose all of Canada. They lose a lot of their possessions in the Caribbean, and they lose Spain, uh, France, ah, Louisiana for a while. But then, of course, they're going to get it back. They're, they're going to get it back. It's going to Louisiana is going to flip flop a couple of times. They're going to lend it to each other and stuff like that. Now, uh, there the hostilities are spread out quite a bit, and you have some Indians that side with the French and you have some Indians that side with the British. That's why they call it the French and Indian War 
because they thought that most of the Indians sided with the French, and that was pretty equal. If you want to see a movie that depicts uh, this, watch Last of the Mohicans. Okay, it's a very good movie. Uh, Daniel Day-Lewis um, did a really good job playing. Well, I don't think he ever does a bad job of any movie. I mean, the guy's amazing. Eventually, the British uh, attack Quebec. They take Quebec or Quebec, and uh, they capture Montreal, and the war is over. What are the outcomes of the war? Well, let me tell you. And this is what you need to know, and this is pretty much where I'm going to leave you off for this lecture. France loses almost all her possessions, as I said before. North America, uh, France cedes Canada to the British. Now, what's really messed up and twisted is that then later on, what's going to happen is the United States wants Canada, and they want it for a long time. The British gain control of Spanish Florida because there was a, how the hell did they take, well, because the, because the Spanish were joined with the French, and fighting the fighting the British, right? Uh, England e emerges from the war incredibly in debt. I'm talking about lots and lots of debt. Uh, I can't tell you how much today, but it's the equivalent of it would be the equivalent of fighting a war, a seven-year war. Now, the, the the average cost of a ship of the line, a fully equipped ship of that time, you know would cost what an aircraft carrier would cost now okay uh now one of the things that really pisses off the uh one of the things that really pisses off the british is that during the war the american colonists would trade with the french the other thing that they would do is that they would uh seize um, uh, colonial American ships, the British would, and they would take the passengers off of them and they would impress them into British military service. Some of these people never came back. That was horrible that they did that. And the other thing that they did is that they would quarter. Uh, they would quarter uh, colonial goods. They would quarter... Uh, <laughs> ah! They would seize uh, colonial goods. They would take them saying that they were going to pay them later on and they wouldn't and they would also quarter soldiers in their barns uh, if they had a barn the colonists were required to provide uh, clean hay so they could sleep on it and in addition to that they had to provide them two pints of beer a day and it wasn't like the beer that we drink now it's a lot like Guinness it was real flat like two percent alcohol beer and that's what they would usually drink because the water wasn't real safe back then okay now this is going to bring us into you know what what are the colonies going to do what you know eventually after fighting the war with france the british become really critical of the colonies and they say we're going to have to tax you because we fought this war on your behalf now that wasn't true i i don't believe that but it was a good way to get money from them okay and in addition to that uh, even though they were going to tax them the equivalent of let's say one penny one shilling the people in england were being taxed 26 shillings per dollar whereas these people were going to get taxed one shilling uh per dollar or per pound so it, it it wasn't like they were being taxed so much, okay? I mean, what we're going to find out later on is that every time that the British come up with uh, some legislation or a law or a tax that they apply, then the colonists are going to behave a certain way. Remember, the government argues that the war was fought on behalf of the colonies, and they were upset that the Americans had engaged in so much smuggling, and they did. They would rather sell to the French and the British because the French would pay them pay them right away. The British would pay them, but only a certain amount of money. You know, they wouldn't pay them what the goods were really worth. 
you know, because they believed in mercantilism and all the above. So that's what we're going to see. So I'm going to go ahead and, and let you go. And I want you all to pay attention to this lecture and read it, uh, listen to it. And remember to uh, tell people about it and like and look out for extra credit that I've been posting. Uh, and make sure you wear your masks and be kind to each other. Okay? Thank you and bye-bye.